Okay. Uh, check. Uh, we're going to start now, uh, unless there's some major, you know, pushback to that. Uh, we have a couple minutes of just introductory stuff before we launch into our whole presentation, so we'll get that out of the way. So we'll definitely have room for questions at the end. Sound good? Awesome. All right. So uh, our project's name, our our talk's name is designing games, experimental games for virtual reality or Oculus Rift. Uh, this is based on a project, stereo, uh, a project uh, called Project Spearhead. And the team was made up of four people. Uh, myself, Alex Lochran, I'm a game designer. Uh, this is Tushar Aurora, he's a programmer. Uh, and then Austin Booker and Frank Hamilton were also part of the team, but they couldn't be here because plane tickets are more expensive than we thought. So our technology is the Oculus Rift Dev Kit. Dev Kit 1, this was a project that was back, uh, I think started in August and September, so didn't have two yet. And we'll get to some challenges lying therein. And yeah, that's uh, that guy, the little guy down in the corner, that's C-3PO. Uh, this project took place at Carnegie Mellon, and it was a 16-week uh, project consisting of 20 deliverables, 14 tests, and six prototypes all around the Oculus Rift. So essentially what we did is we had 16 weeks to do as much as we possibly could. Uh, our schedule looked like that if you're interested. So six weeks literally like going every other day we were doing some different test and building something different in Unity. And then for weeks eight through 15, we were just trying to combine as many weird prototypes as we could. And then we have a documentation uh, which is what you guys will find most interesting online, we actually show you everything that we did, all of our results. So what we are. When, uh, do you guys remember the Kickstarter videos and all of the, the talk that came out when the Oculus Rift was first launched? A lot of people were talking about, oh my god, this and Skyrim, this and Counter-Strike is going to be ridiculous. Uh, the first thing we thought was, it is going to be ridiculous, but we want nothing to do with that. We didn't want to try to make the best first-person game. We don't, didn't have the time. We only had four people. We didn't have a lot of friends. So we realized we couldn't make a big dev team. So we were rapid prototyping, rapid design, uh, just trying to get as much crap out there as possible. Everything looks terrible, but it's, all, it's trying to keep doing new things with the Oculus. Because we wanted to see if you could make weird stuff with virtual reality that, you know, Makes virtual, people. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it makes people puke, weird controller-based stuff. Uh, we'll explain. So what we're not is concerned about creating immersive VR games. We're not worried about that. Not worried about a fi finished product. So all of our art's blue. And we're not worried about failure. We're not at all worried about like, hey, you had this idea and it didn't work. You have to explain yourself. Well, we don't. It didn't work. You now know not to do that when you guys go make your stuff. All right, test overview. We did 14 tests. You can just look at the top. Gesture test, art test, control test, and motion test. So little things like dealing with text, um, dealing with the Oculus control as a controller. So instead of this turning the camera, it moves your character right and moves your character left. We had six prototypes, third person rig, um, and we'll show you pictures of some of these as well. By the way, everything is online. So when we don't talk about something and you want to know what it looked like or you want to watch gameplay of it or you have an Oculus at home and you want to play it, all of our demos, all of our files, if you want to change a texture and call it your own and make a million dollars, go ahead. I'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the way it's going, our talk is going to break down is we each have six points to make. And of these six points, I'm gonna, he's going to do one, I'm going to do one. And we're basically going to give you straightforward advice on developing for experimental stuff with VR. So without further ado, Tushar, you want to make your first point? Uh, so yeah, the first point, uh, the first thing that we learned while playing around with the device was that uh, you can move the camera. Uh, you can take the control away from the player. Uh, so when the Oculus Rift came out, we attended a bunch of talks in GDC uh, where everyone was uh, sort of stressing on this point where they didn't want us to take control away. They said it's nauseating. So we wanted to challenge that. Why is this nauseating? How can you make it better? Uh, we wanted to address those points, and we ran on something called as a gesture transition test. What we did here was uh, we had a puzzle a few feet away from the player. It was normal FPS controls. He walks towards the puzzle. Uh, but a lot of games do this. 
where if, if they want you to focus on something, they take the camera and focus on it. Uh, but when you do things like that with the riff, it can make you nause nauseous, it can make you puke. Um, so you want to know why and how we can fix that. Uh, so what we did was we did a, we did a very similar transition, uh, showed the player the puzzle, and I think most of our play testers did not notice the transition happen. Um, one of the biggest points we took away from that was that the animation or the speed at which you do this transition should be similar to the speed at which the player moves. When you do it at this rate, uh, the probability of them noticing or feeling nauseous is very, very low. Yeah, so the thing is I'll add and let me pull up. Okay. Uh, so we actually have the first, the same first point. Uh, the other thing that we did with this test was the idea of switching camera, using the Oculus Rift as a controller. And when we talk about that, and we're going to mention that a lot, so let me backtrack. And So the Oculus Rift is able to track your head's movement, your head's rotation. And one of the things that we were really fixated on was this idea of instead of using it as turning the camera in just like a, a person's head, we wanted to use it as your way of locomoting around the world or operating different things. So what we did with this test was, first off, we were going to move the player's camera. You're looking up, we're going to force you to, to lerp in between and look down. Uh, everyone said don't do that. Uh, Palmer Lucky has said that multiple times. We tried it with uh, like 20 people, and most people didn't notice that it was forcing them to do that. They just thought it was a natural head movement, now they're looking. The other thing is if you do that and you do it right, they know that you were telling them to look there and they are looking there. It's the greatest form of indirect control on the planet because you just took their head and you want, you need to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> and when I you do that, <laughs> I don't care what that is. If I go look at that, there's a reason he's not looking there and he'll figure it out. So if you force a player to look at something, he will do, he will start moving his head and he'll start hitting buttons and suddenly, oh, it moved. Oh, I see, I move the block with my head now and that's what we, we worked. So using move, force movement with head controls works really, really well and doesn't make them vomit. Main part. Yeah. Okay, so um, Alex's point number two because I bogarted his point. Sensitivity settings are paramount to good experience. You guys play first-person shooters? Everybody, you know, you ever play your friend's first-person shooter? He's got that weird mouse set sensitivity. Uh, that needs to happen in your Oculus game. That needs to happen in your Oculus game. When we were working on this, we did a quick test. There's a little red dot, and then there's a green sort of disc. All we did was the disc would bounce around, and you would have to touch the disc with the dot by moving your head. What we did was we created, and of course this is going to be hard to look, so I'm just going to point. So what we did was we had 10 users with five different sensitivity settings. Ooh, we can use the most. Yeah. Um, so this is easier, no use the classroom stuff. So 10 users, sensitivity 0.25 meant every, every time they moved their head 10 units, the cursor only moved 2.5 units. So you can imagine literally throwing your head back and forth just to get the cursor to move a bit. What we found is that there really isn't that much of a consensus. In fact, sensitivity one to one was one of the least popular. People didn't like when you move 10 units, the Oculus moved 10 units. So you have to give them a setting, you have to play with that. And we did that a lot with our prototypes. We, you know, it felt weird that, you know, we play games in the Oculus, it feels weird. It's because your perception of movement in the game isn't the same as how far you think you should be moving your head in real life. So that's a big thing uh, you have to worry about. Ah. We're gonna skip around a lot. So how many of you are Oculus developers, just out of curiosity? Cool. How many of you are game developers, just out of curiosity? Woo! All right. Um, where's our presentation too, Shar? Yeah, hard disk. <laughs> Okay, 
technical difficulties. Yeah, it has to be in every presentation. There needs to be technical difficulties. And that's why we save our presentation in a hard disk and not in our system. <laughs> You said it's a hard disk? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to do this a little bit more free form. But the next point you were going to make. Just get the image, I'll talk. Yeah. All right. So uh, this is perhaps my favorite point throughout our project. Like, this is uh, one of the biggest things. Um, how do you make the UI not look terrible on the Oculus Rift? Uh, when the Oculus Rift, again, it came out, people were like, oh no, UI needs to be redesigned. It's, it's not clear along the sides. What should we do? And the answer is very simple. Uh, you don't have to redesign anything. Uh, you just have to make it more visible. So how can we make it more visible? Uh, by, at, when you look at a normal TV screen, this is how you look at it. It's probably flat. It's, when you look at a monitor, it's flat. You're able to see everything because there's no distortion of anything on your lens. There's no lens. There's no distortion. There's no fisheye effect. Uh, on the Oculus Rift, however, every, every, the images, when, when you see them, are, are, at, are what do you call this? Uh, I like that image. Uh, so, <laughs> fisheye effect. Yeah, fisheye effect. Uh, so how can you make this clear? All you have to do is uh, incline your text to look at the camera. So normally the UI is like this when I'm looking at a screen. When I'm at the Oculus, because of the distortion, tilt it towards the player's camera. That way it makes it more clear in material of where you place it. Um, so what we did was we. So this is what this is what we're getting at to make it abundantly clear. So when you look through the Oculus, you look through lenses that are curved. And when you place text like this, it actually gets bent around the lenses. And you have a, you have a fisheye effect distorting the edges of your vision. That's why uh, people have played Oculus. Anybody played Team Fortress 2 on the Oculus? All of their, all of their text, all of their UI elements are pushed to the center, and it looks really weird. And they're pushed to the center because there's, you can see here, when you put a flat plane of text, uh, which normally you do when you do UI, you, put, you either have some sort of text rendering engine, but it renders it as a flat surface. Uh, readability, we had 12 people. So 12 out of 12 readability is sitting right in the middle. You can't put UI right in the middle. It looks ridiculous. <laughs> and as you go towards the edge, you can't read it, so it screwed up a lot of people because you can't do this anymore because it bends around you know, the edge of the bull. So how do we fix? We inclined, so what we did was we tilted all the UI towards the corners to face the, to face the player according to the way in which it's uh, with the fisheye effect. I'm not sure if I'm making it very clear. No, uh, yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> if, if that is your eye, all you need to do is tilt it this way so that it's clear towards the center of your eye. When you do that, uh, the, the results we found was that it makes the corners a little more clear than how it is. So this way, all the game UI that you have with you know things around the edges, things around the corners, you can still use that. And I think that is the strongest essence and the strongest point we found because uh, AAA companies or indie developers do not have to follow two different UIs just to satisfy two different demographics. And this kind of fixes that for you. So yeah. And once we, uh, I don't know if we mentioned it in our, our slides now. Um, one of the things we, we did was, what you just established was a camera look at function. Yeah. So when, you're, when you have pop up stuff like press E to open door, instead of just having it you know, pop up, it wants to look at the camera. So wherever it is, it will, you know, as your head moves, it will adjust itself and stay readable even on the edges of your vision, which is pretty important. And anytime you do anything with, uh, with text in the Oculus, you have to be really careful. Uh, test it, test it again, give it to someone else, make sure someone without glasses test it, because text is a kind of a jerk in Oculus world. All right, so you made that point. And then, actually, give me one second, guys. I plugged something in. Let me see if we have our correct presentation. Always the best situation when you screw up in front of all of you fine folks. But I'll cop to it. We 
I think we're just going to move on. Yeah, we're just going to move on. All right. So we won't waste any more of your time. All right. So the third point I want to make is letting the player move their actual body. So one of the things, and I'll come out with this real quick, I dislike about some of the direction VR is taking is this idea of not being able to uh, move. Uh, you can move your head. You can now move DK2. You can move position, so you can go like this. But some people, uh, <coughs> are coming forth and saying that you should not be stood up while you're playing. You should not, to get the most amount of realism and immersion, you should be standing so we, or sitting so we can control uh, your experience more accurately. I dislike this. I think letting the player, especially when you're doing experimental stuff, letting the player move and walk around is something that is huge. It's going to make, it's going to make a, it's not going to be accurate. It doesn't feel like moving around in real life but it's going to create a sensation that I don't think we've really been able to tap into. It doesn't feel like Kinect, it doesn't feel like DDR, it doesn't feel like you're actually out there on a world. It feels completely different and I think embracing that is very important. So point three uh, starts out with the picture of us outside is a test that we did that was our uh, walking motion test. We had people in a plane with the Oculus, so we had them set up in a row of cones and we challenge them to walk forward in the row of cones, pressing forward on a control stick while walking forward in real life. And the idea was, can, we, can the forward motion they feel just walking around uh, line up with the forward motion of them in the game? It didn't. I don't have, not yet. Um, it did not. What did work, though, is if you look forward in a game and you focus on something off in the distance and you start walking, so like if I'm just focusing like this, and I'm looking at a cone, and I walk forward, you walk in a perfectly straight line. Your feeling of being in the world allows you to walk around things. And if you do map somebody's position, so let's say you're in, a, you're in the LVE space, you're working for Disney. If you were able to position people, use sensors, GPS, whatever, I don't know what the technology would be, that's your job. Uh, you could very easily expect people to put on an Oculus and walk into the next room. You could have people do an intro video wearing an Oculus in a room, walking around, and everything is beautiful. And then after a story is told, pull the thing off and the whole room is covered in blood. <laughs> very easily, very, very doable. And you could have them interact with the, the world as they are in, you know, with an Oculus on, and they wouldn't be bumping into each other, they wouldn't be falling down the steps because your perception of depth and perception of walking around in space is pretty accurate. Um, so one of the things that we started doing is we have our first, uh, mm -hmm. so we created a, there we go. So we created a prototype using this. So we had full 3D, we had full uh, 3D cap, capture position tracking. Position tracking. Uh, we did this with the PlayStation Move, uh, the PSI. So yeah, there's there's two PS Moves connected to his head because if one is getting blocked, it tracks the other. Uh, what we tried to do was uh, create this position tracking sort of experience where you remove the Oculus Rift and uh, use it as a device as well. What we were trying to get at was understand three main things. Uh, one is, uh, can we walk around with the Oculus? Two, can we use it as an object or an interactive device in itself? Uh, and three was, where can this fit in? Uh, so, yeah. so yeah, we'll uh, give you a quick rundown of what's happening on screen. So he's got the Oculus on, and it's tracking his data using a PS Move controller. Uh, you can see the one screen, the two eyes, that's the Oculus. That's, a, that's his Oculus device. That's what he's seeing. The other screen is a third monitor, is a, another monitor that we're using to track a bunch of data. So that's part of other experiences that we are working with. Let me turn the sound off. Um, and we can talk about that if you have questions on it. One of the, our experience, 
experiments with this was can you use a monitor with outside information when you're working with the Oculus? You guys, you have your monitor inside, and most people have a monitor on their computer, so why not take advantage of that extra real estate to hide information from the player until they decide to access it by taking the Oculus off? That's an extra experiment. What we are talking about here is this idea of, you can see that he's moving around pretty, pretty rambunctiously. He jumps in this game. We have the coins spawn at a height that's higher than him. So he's actually, he'll, he'll jump, he's walking forward, we have the monitor sitting right in front of him. So if this didn't work, you would smack him to the monitor, he would be hitting into the walls. As long as you establish your, your boundaries, Walking around the Oculus is ridiculous. It's literally like nothing I've ever felt before. And if you're looking to make something unique, I, you have to try this. You have to try getting the, um, the motion tracking to work one-to-one -one and just walk around. So yeah, I'll just iterate and add a few more points on the third yeah. monitor. Um, the reason um, I felt that, was the, that, that this is important is uh, when you're making an experience uh, and you want to use this monitor as an entity, you can give more data, number one, uh, but if you're doing something where you're theming your room to be like this horror show, uh, and you're playing a horror game inside, you take off your Oculus, the environment still adds to it, makes it feel like an immersive experience, and you have additional data in front of you which helps you play your game. So it's a good uh, enhancement to your experience. So uh, think places like Disney or Universal Studios can make very good use of this um, by theming their experience to be very good. So if you're making experiences for them, it, it's an advantage you can take. Okay, so we're talking mostly about motion and adding it in, or allowing your players that freedom of moving around in meat space, uh, in addition to moving around in their game. So we did a lot of these walking tests, a lot of tracking position, what it's like for the Oculus to pick up on you moving to the right, moving to the left. One of the things we wanted to try was sort of a disparate motion. So we're moving one way while we're doing something completely different in the game. So perhaps you're moving in a car while playing a different, a walking around game on your, you know, on your Oculus. We wanted to talk, we wanted to check that out. So the next thing, I believe, is let the player move their actual body, even if it means playing in a car. So one of the things that we did was we played Oculus Rift in a car. Don't drive with it. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the first thing that we attempted to do was just get the Oculus moving in a car. Uh, can anyone guess why that doesn't work? If you turn the car, what happens in game? The Oculus turns. The Oculus tracks your rotation, so the changes in rotation. So if your head's facing this way and the car goes like that, your head's now facing that way. So it makes everything really difficult. So if you're curious about doing this, what we did was we networked two laptops with two Oculuses, and we had actually one sitting in, in between the guy's legs, and then we had a, uh, and so that one was always facing forward, so whenever you turned your head, it would detect the change and allow you to turn in the game. Basically, it's like attaching an Oculus to the car to cancel out its rotation, and one Oculus to, for the player's experience. Yeah. Bad way of doing it, but meh. It, it works, uh, it had some problems, and if you want to try something where you wear an Oculus in a car, let us know. Um, so, but essentially what we're trying to do, besides play with networking with the Oculus, we were trying to see is one, can you play Oculus in a car physically? Like, is it possible to make something where you can play the Oculus in a car? It is, uh, it worked. Uh, you do have to get at the source code, so you're not gonna be able to do it with uh, any major games. But if you make a game yourself, you play it in the car. Um, two, is it physically possible? <laughs> is it nauseatingly possible to play Oculus in a car? So we'll take a look at Tushar playing the Oculus in a car. And you can see right there on his lap is his game. And check out, uh, if you can see sort of what he's doing right now, he's just using his head to move around in a game and fly through holes. And what I'm doing is we're going through a parking lot and I'm literally going like this in a car. Just going back and forth. And he's trying to, be, to go straight and make little tiny adjustments with his head. 
as he flies through this sort of patchwork, uh, like hole in the wall game. And we were able to do it a little bit worse than we were if we were sitting still. But for the most part, we were able to complete this like little puzzle game. Wow, and you can see me grabbing the wheel and slamming it to the right, and then grabbing the wheel and slamming it to the left. We're literally going like this, and we're able to do a pretty accurate game. And we were able to play, and it was, um, the game has a constant motion, and stopping was one of the weirdest things I think I've ever experienced. Uh, and this is what this project, and we did some weird shit. Um, so it's possible to play in a car. You don't throw up, you're not gonna vomit everywhere. Not only that, it makes things happen that shouldn't happen, like it gives you uh, experience that you can't get anywhere else playing Oculus in a car. And again, we usually talk to Disney with, uh, talk about Disney with this. It's perfectly imaginable to have a roller coaster with virtual reality. You have to be careful because they used to try this and it didn't work very well back then. But um, if you did something like that, or even if you were like working on like some sort of haunted house where you know you wanted to turn the room, uh, I'm trying to think of like smaller projects, you know, where everyone wears a mask and the room flips, but it turns the other way in the uh, you know in the virtual world. You could do stuff like that. It's doable on a budget, and not only is it doable on a budget, it's going to make something memorable within your experience. So if moving the player at a different way or fast or in a car while moving them in the Oculus differently than they're moving in real life is doable, it's a lot of fun, and you're going to get a reaction. Maybe bad, maybe you'll give them a headache, but you're definitely going to get a reaction. And if you're experimenting, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something new experience. And that's a good lead into your point. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the, the point that I'd like to make is don't be scared to push your players because uh, you don't know their limits. Uh, one of the prototypes that we made is kind of a justifiable point for this. Uh, we made this game called Headless Horseman. Uh, Hold on, I'll bring it up, I got you. All right, uh, I'll just explain the game mechanics till you bring it up. Uh, so the idea was that you're, you're holding your head in your hand mm -hmm. and tossing it around to get a feel, to basically solve puzzles. <laughs> so you hold your head in your hand with this move. You yeah. Want to explain the controls. Uh, we had a navigator on the other hand where that controls the body's moving forward, not the head. So you're holding your head, you're moving forward with a controller, uh, PS Move Navigator controller. Uh, you can toss your, so the PS Move is your head, right? You can toss your head by holding the trigger, uh, and then you can, call, you can toss your head, and what, then you can you call mean, it back. What do you mean by your head? What is your head? Your head is the actual camera. So when you toss your head, you see something flying off, and you can call it back. So you can see where, this is actually a really good picture, you can see how, he's, how his head is turned, his head's turned back, and his, he, his hand's extended forward. So his camera is here, looking back on his in-game body. So his head is wherever the PS Move controller is. And what we added was, and weirdly we found, and what, why do you have my this is not yours. hard drive? Oh, uh, this is, um, <laughs> no mind, carry on. <laughs> this is mine, this is not yours. Uh, this has a clearer sure. video of Headless Horseman. Yeah. I have it on here too, not okay. that bad. Okay. <laughs> he works at Google, he knows more than me. <laughs> um, so this was a weird experience for us developing this, because we thought, like, Dude, this is gonna be ridiculous. This is gonna be out of control. And uh, the the point, the title of his point that we're making right now is what? Push your players. Uh, so we thought that we were gonna blow people's minds with this idea of like I'm holding my own head and I can turn and see my body. It really wasn't that big of a deal. Like it was weird to move your head up and down, but you do this a couple times, and you look back on your body and it feels really weird. But then you're like it. It very quickly became normalized. Never like, yeah, I'm just walking around like I do in you know, Duke Nukem or whatever, but it, was, it became normal faster than we ever imagined, and people were immediately desensitized to it. So we added our throwing mechanic, oh, yeah. which <laughs> is here, where you literally, you toss your camera, 
And not only do you toss your camera, you return, you retain um, control over your body. So I toss my head over there, my body stays here, I'm looking that way, I have to turn my head in Oculus like that, and then I have to move my body through a gate and then snap my head back to my body. So I'm literally like turned like this to see my body walk over, over me and then I gotta line myself back up and snap back onto my body. And you also have to go through the motion of being thrown on your, like your head being thrown. Uh, so we'll show you a video of that and we'll talk about sort of. <laughs> do, 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 do presentation materials. Wait, is this where? I don't care anymore. You guys don't care about the right presentation you want to see? People throwing heads. <laughs> Is that a correct assumption? Hey, there's me. Okay. So I'm going through the instruction screens. There we go. So you can see my, where my arm's position is. Now I'm moving in front of my body. And now I'm walking around. These are back in the old dev graphics. So you can see how I'm actually able to reach my head over and see the door. So I use the correct door. We did have clipping errors. <laughs> Again, none of this is supposed to be pretty. So the idea of the game that we had was you use your head to look around obstacles. And let me pause so I can talk. Yeah, that's a good pause. Uh, can you guys see that well enough? I know it's hard, I apologize, I wish we had a giant, well, a giant thing, but if you can't and you want to sit down here or whatever, that's totally fine. Um, so the idea of the game we made was you're looking around obstacles to find the wrong door and then go to the right door. So for this little fence, I couldn't look over it. Wasn't able to, it's too high. So what I ended up doing was throw my head up. And I'm wearing the, the Oculus, so I throw my head up and I take a bird's eye view, come crash into the earth, and then I immediately snap myself back into my hand. And if you've played the Oculus, uh, the roller coaster mod, the roller coaster demo for the Oculus, you guys know what motion feels like? And then you throw yourself and then have to look back on your own body. So yeah, these were some of the, uh, the puzzles. That motion was incredibly disor uh, disorientating, coupled with the fact that you could turn around and look at yourself and then have to watch your body move, but my body's here, but it's over there, but my head's turned like this, but it's not really turned because it's laying on the floor on this button, and then I can snap myself back, and now that I'm looking this way, suddenly I'm on this part of the body, I'm looking that way. It was really confusing, but we managed, people liked playing it. Yeah. So I'm watching myself. <laughs> it was this puzzle where you throw your head towards one button, you yeah, stand on another, and then start moving. Oh, here's, here's another one. So you literally throw your head up, and you land on these, this button, and now I have to turn around and find my body. <laughs> and I walk through the door, and now... I uh, snap back. There we go. That's not even the most ridiculous one. Let's, let's move ahead to, I forget who designed this one. Ah, uh, this one. So like you literally have to bounce your head off the wall, back onto a button, and then back yourself out of this ramp, and then uh, like over and around to somewhere else. We did a, uh, there's a bunch of stuff like that in here. But the idea is that you're doing these weird things, like literally bouncing your camera, which you're wearing, and motion feels so strange in the Oculus. You're bouncing off onto this pane and then having to twist your body around and watch your body walk out of a room. Uh, we were giving these to uh, most of our faculty, and they don't play games. Uh, they don't play, you know, they definitely haven't played with the Oculus much. And a lot of them were able to play. Yeah. You, you argue this point, too. Uh, yeah. You can so, totally argue negatives with me. Yeah, it, it made me feel nauseous, uh, honest reply. Uh, were, but, were you able to finish the game? 
Yeah, uh, the biggest thing that we take out from this is that uh, the upper nauseating limit of players is higher than you think it is. So if you think someone might puke, think again. Uh, <laughs> That's, the big, that's, that's a good thing to know because you can push your, uh, you can design your game in a way that helps reduce this. So in this game particularly, uh, what, we, uh, what I wanted to do, what I didn't end up doing was slowing down the speed at which you throw. So if you throw at a slower rate, it means, I mean, for me, I'm more comfortable seeing it go slower because that's my movement sensitivity. Um, so if you club that with this, you still have the same experience which people with different nauseating levels can experience. Uh, and you're still making crazy weird shit, which is awesome. Yeah, that's um, the other thing, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. The, the place where you can push people playing the Oculus is very, very, very far away. Um, we've done some insane stuff uh, with, when we were doing the car thing, uh, we were getting it working in a car, what we did to test whether or not our movement cancellation out was we put people in a office chair and then we spun them around and then we had them play a game. Uh, and it was weird, but again, nobody threw up. Nobody's gonna throw up playing this. And if someone's able to make you throw up, uh, Give that let me know a cookie. so I can play that <laughs> Oculus experience because I would really like to check that out. Because um, I've literally never seen any like anybody throw up. Uh, we've had a couple of people major headaches and not able to work the rest of the day. <laughs> Faculty, <laughs> but like they still were able to come back, and it got like less and less. And a lot of that time, it's because you haven't eaten a lot or you haven't been drinking water all day, and it drastically uh, affects how well you're able to play Oculus games. So when you look at this and you think like, oh my gosh, it's going to be horrible, and I'm never going to be able to play it probably wrong. You're going to be able to play it. Um, and the other point, you were unable to, you didn't like this game as much. I didn't like uh, one of, I can, and I can show you guys, uh, I forget which game was it. It was b-ball or something like that. And we can show you if you're curious. We're going to open it up in a few minutes. Um, I love this game, but there was a game that we were playing that I could not touch, but he loved. So when you think about your creations and you play something and it's interesting and your friend goes, oh my gosh, we have to release this. And you go, no, it gave me a headache. You probably, it's a difference. And it's not anything that can be tracked to motion sickness uh, or uh, the car sickness. We tested a lot of stuff that was really weird on people who got car sick and they found no issue with this. Um, I'm an athlete, I do lots of stuff where I drive motorcycles, I do a lot of roller coasters, he doesn't. He had a different, he was sometimes tougher than me, sometimes not in regards to the Oculus. So it's a very strange metric of who's going to accept the Oculus, who's, going, who's not. And there is no like harsh line. So don't worry about going past that imaginary line. Yeah. Don't worry about if, it's, if it does give you a little bit of a headache when you're looking for something that's you know, extremely exciting. You know, when you have your idea that's better than a headless horseman, which I'm sure everybody here does, make it. Make it, and when it starts to hurt your head, figure out why it hurts your head, and see if you can separate that from the messed up part. Because like he said, the main, main issue is all we have to do is include an option to slow the head movement down, and it'll be okay. Or we, you know, we just make it a, a slow motion effect. Uh, um, that's gonna be a rabbit hole. But the idea is that you can push your players, and if you're not, you're probably not doing anything interesting. You know, if nobody has a headache playing your game, you're probably not going crazy enough. All right, um, so we have a bunch of other stuff that we can show you. Uh, we're sitting here at 36. So we got a bunch of time for questions. So if you prompt us with some, oh, okay. <laughs> so you're talking about how um, for some people, they, they would get a headache from doing Probably not, like, it's, it's not going to be like a, if you keep playing, the headache's going to go away. Or even like a play for five minutes, you know, uh, leave and then come back for five minutes. Uh, some people had a bit of wooziness in the beginning, and playing through that worked. 
a uh, couple times, uh, the first couple times I played, it felt weird for five, ten minutes, went away. But the headache stuff is a lot to do with, um, you've worn the, have you worn the Oculus? No. Oh, okay. Uh, if it's not fit right and you are using it as a controller, it can, like, temple hit and it can hurt the bridge of your nose a bit. And that sometimes is the culprit for headaches. Other times, if it is that simulator sickness that everybody talks about, um, it might be something you, it's really hard to figure out what that is. But they do get more and more used to it as they play day to day to day. So they can't play through that simulator sickness. You have to figure it out. Like, is it the thing hitting their head? Is it just because they've never played before? Or are they getting a headache that's because of something? Um, and I can go into a lot of detail with this, but uh, if it's something with that similar sickness, that similar <coughs> sickness, that weird woozy feeling that's not quite car sick, they can sort of build a tolerance. Like we had a pretty decent tolerance towards the end of that, yeah. that you know, because we, we had been working in VR. So yeah, you can build a tolerance to similar sickness, but you gotta make sure it's not a headache because their Oculus is not correctly fastened. Uh, one thing I'd like, I'd like to add to that is uh, we noticed instances where they, they played fine while they were in the world. Once they finished it, they took it off, and that's when they started feeling weird. Um, so that again, if, if you start messing with the horizon uh, in your game and then bring them back to reality, it's give them a good transition time, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Give them a seat, water, and something to eat. <laughs> it's legit. Um. About the <coughs> sensitivity stuff, did you dive in at all to ways to like calibrate that or intuit uh, an appropriate sensitivity setting without like explicit user slider control? We didn't. Uh, no, you mentioned that's a good idea. Uh, we had no. I think the sensitivity thing took two days. Uh, um, that feels like that's a larger research project. But, but yeah, yeah, they um they very. They were very vocal to, what they what they wanted. They were very much, you know, during the test it was, oh, this feels weird, or like, I don't like this, or like, this one's nice, I like this one. And it was actually pretty accurate to the ones that they, were, they had the best score with. So if you're looking to do something like that, implement your game, it might be enough to, was that a, okay. Um, it might be just enough to give them a little game to play in the sensitivity slider, just so they can like, click two, nope, click point seven. Yeah, all right. Um, one more question, two more questions? Oh, awesome, yay. So no more questions, oh. just sit here. <laughs> uh, I noticed you broke real fast, fast past the slide about color choices. Why was that relevant? Oh, um, I'll go back to that slide. Let's talk about it. Because we that. thought we had way less time than we, we did. Okay, so one of the things that he discovered <coughs> with the Tuscany mod, Tuscany mod, uh, Demo. Uh, sorry. Oh, there's this. Uh, so in the Tuscany demo that comes with uh, the Oculus Rift, there was this sunflower, bright sunflower, at one corner of the level. And when I looked at it, I instantaneously felt nauseous. It was. It was. Uh, it took me a while to figure out why I was feeling nauseous at that stage. And then I realized it's the saturation of the color that's hitting my eye. So what we did was we conducted this test. We used all of these colors, and we had them like smack dab in front of this big plane of text. And the idea was they have to stare at this color and if they're able to read it very easily, it's a color that doesn't bother you in the Oculus. Uh, and I forget which ones we, oh yeah, these were the, it's the saturated colors that are the most problematic, not the brightest, which was what our hypothesis was, but these super dark colors, especially if they have a bad contrast to whatever else you're trying to get them to look at. Uh, so again, be very careful with that. And that actually threw us off in a couple things. There's a test um, here that was kind of, you know, even the colors we were chosen, this red was kind of, ugh. Um, and we would probably like to see differently if we had more time. Uh, and question. one more thing to that is that the DK kit that we were using had a lot of pixelation, so we didn't stress a lot on this being an issue towards the future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, I keep seeing your hands, so I feel like you've been raising it constantly. Uh, reticles, crosshairs, in the middle of the target. Ah. Have you, uh, obviously in, in a 2D game, they're rendered at one point, that's the bit you're shooting at. But obviously in a 3D game, two eyes, it's gonna be pointing at a different part of the, of the world. 
have you approached how to do that element of UI? Isn't that done? Uh, we didn't exactly address that because we weren't looking at FPSs, uh, but I think the way you can fix that is, uh, or rather it's already fixed, the Oculus yeah. comes with, uh, so the distance between your eyes uh, and the, how much you can see in uh, um, DPI is the term I'm looking for, I think. Uh, it's, uh, it's around 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 centimeters. And the Oculus comes with that fixed already. So it shouldn't be an issue as long as you just throw in texture which matches uh, yeah, the way, um, the way and we use Unity a lot, and I haven't done too much in Unreal as far as VR. The way it does is it doesn't like, you only have one camera, and it automatically adds that second camera you, uh, to the measurement of the Oculus's lenses. So you can play with that with some of the SDKs or some of the other APIs to adjust that, but from what we found with our crosshairs, never needed adjustment. Yeah. So it's pretty well it's pretty well done. So you just attach it to the front of that camera, just like you would do normally. The uh, that's a huge accolade I'll give to Oculus. They have an amazing SDK, and they're so damn quick with just updating it and letting us play with it. Like the fact that it's free and it's on everything. You know, Unreal uh, Four isn't even like technically really out yet, like finished, and it's like one of the first things that was in there was support for Oculus Rift. So that is one thing I love about Oculus. They're very open and helpful. Uh, anybody else? So you mentioned the, during the sensitivity testing that the one-to-one -one was the least popular of the options. Um, that seems to create a tension for doing anything, say, location-based, where tracking somebody's head and body in motion, you know, if somebody turns 90 degrees, that what, both what they see and where they actually are should turn 90 degrees. Um, does that just seem weird, or, how, or do you, is there something that you think could get around that? So just to add to that, the sensitivity tests that we ran uh, were highly concentrated on the fact that we were trying to do this gesture-based or trying to use the Oculus as a controller. So that meant that you would sit and just use it as a controller to, to, to play your game. Um, in location-based, if you're using it as a controller, that might be something you'd want to ask. Uh, but I think they're two different mediums in itself. Um, unless you have something more to add. I think you do bring up a good point, because one of the things that we were doing that partially because Oculus, Oculus using gesture controls, but it's also something to think about. When you move this way, some people think that they've moved their head this much. And also, you know, in some first person shooters, you're going to want that sensitivity disconnect, where you can't, to look behind you, you can't do that because you're gonna break your you're gonna break your neck at some point. <laughs> um, so, it is, so sensitivity in regards to the Oculus as a camera is something to think about. What I would need to do before I agree that it's a problem is I would need to do that exact same sensitivity test in a uh, in an LBE situation because we we sort of did it with them sitting down in a very abstract space. So I would need to basically load up one of our prototypes and change the sensitivity. Because I think I think you're right. That might be an issue, um, but I have to witness it because we didn't. So one thing I think to add to that is, if you've ever used Track IR, that uses it's basically where it uses infrared light uh, with an attachment that you wear basically in a hat or just a regular TV, so that uh, it's used in flight simulators and stuff like Arma. So basically, you rotate your head a little bit and it'll move a lot, so that you can keep your eyes on the actual TV screen but still get head tracking in the game. Um, so. That's kind of been done with modified sensitivity of head turning. So maybe you play with that a bit and then just find out that how it's different with like having the Oculus and yeah. uh, with the presence going on at the same time. I think especially with gamers, like we we're used to this stuff happening all the time. Uh, we every every we like this means you go like that. You know, and we're sort of used to that disconnect and that sort of motion bus button press. So even if I'm in a perfect space going like this is actually me like bending down to pick something up and then I just interpret that differently. Like I just save that in my brain and I know that that's my new motion for, you know, this is bending down picking up. Any other questions? Uh, have you done any experiments with like a head mounted camera and like augmented reality <laughs> with the Show it. <laughs> <laughs> We had this debate of whether or not to show one particular video, <laughs> and he was like, no, we're not doing it. <laughs> Yay. 
Okay. <laughs> so, just to add a little bit of gristle into this presentation, you guys see that thing on Polygon, that dude that did the 3D, the third person camera? We did that months ago. <laughs> Uh, but we so, suck. We didn't write it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are two different cameras here. Again, at 2.5 uh, inches, uh, very similar to how much your eyes, uh, how your eyes are apart. And we try to create the stereoscopic view and an AR thing where, hey, let's walk around and see if it feels good. It feels weird. So here's the thing. With <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing with uh, we did the front-mounted thing. Uh, it's. The problem is like the cameras have to be very, very good. Um, it's also weird because your eyes see it's such a different uh, field, of view. field of view that most cameras are. Camera, the cameras like that aren't made to see like our eyes. They're made to see it like, uh, I think it's like 23 millimeters, whereas our eyes are like 55, depending on your eyesight. Our, your usable range is about 55 millimeter translated to cameras. So it's very strange. And then on top of that, getting two cameras to work with AR was so, oh my gosh. <laughs> we wasted so much time with that, like weeks of just, and we didn't have weeks. <laughs> and like trying this whole idea of like, how do you do AR with 3D space, with two cameras? So like, what do you do? Do you use QR codes and you just hope that you can pick up on it? And how do you like gamify that? So if you could do something like that and you could figure it out, because I guarantee someone will, um, but it, for us, it was a huge black hole. Um, yeah, we didn't have time to invest in it because yeah. we had like two weeks to do this and we already spent like three and three and a half on it. Oh, uh, and the one thing is, if you do ever, if anyone <laughs> tries to do AR with the Oculus Rift, please use two cameras because I don't think one camera is anywhere, like if you lose that 3D perception, it feels, it feels terrible. Yeah, and the issue when you use two cameras is that most of the AR plugins are singletons, which means you can use only one instance of it. So that's why we had a trouble. We were like, who'll write a plugin? So yeah, yeah you'd have to write your own plugin. Uh, and then if, when you do, you let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious if, uh, and maybe this is something that requires additional testing, but having an array of cameras, so more than one or two, like a multitude of them, and then selectively picking a field of view to put back into the Oculus. That was sort of a lot of the ideas. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, we talked about doing stuff like that where instead of just one head for Headless Horseman, you would like have a variety of heads and you would... Uh, um, another thing that we talked about uh, was mapping controls to your hands and your feet and trying to navigate a space where you can't use your head but you have to use your hand and like you have to like reach out and grab a, an imaginary thingy. But this is your camera. So you can't use the imaginary thing, so you gotta snap to this hand. So now you get this is your hand and you gotta open the door. And now you gotta grab the, the door with this, so you gotta snap to that. You know, you know, the constantly changing perspectives is something that's really cool with the Oculus. Because it's fun to be here, but it's way cooler if you're like this amorphous blob that flicks your, you know, your perspective everywhere, or you get like a timer, you know, with your perspective that you can use this for a little bit, but then you gotta use something like a toadstool or you know, a refrigerator, something like that. Any other questions? All right, we are Done. Awesome. Thank you, guys.